Okay, we're uh, we're live on Facebook. Uh, all right. Well, I don't uh, I don't see it yet. See it in a second. You'll see it in about twenty seconds, probably. Okay. Uh, I think that's right. Anyway, calm down, Kathy. Just calm anyway, down, Kathy. Yeah, calm down, Kathy. Get ahead of yourself there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, folks, this is Landis Wade here with Charlotte's Podcast. Uh, so happy to be with you tonight. We've got a, a, a great event. I'm um, really looking forward to it. Uh, first of all, I am the host of Charlotte's Podcast, where authors give voice to the written words. It's an audio podcast where you can uh, hear authors talk about their books and their writing life. And uh, I'm also an author, too. got three books, a fourth on the way. But you can uh, find out more about that at LandisWade.com or at, at uh, Charlotte'sPodcast.com. As of today, I'm happy to say that we have uh, we've released 244 audio episodes on Charlotte Readers Podcast. So let's let's do this, wow. folks. You know, so and all everybody who's here today uh, has been on the podcast. That's great. Um, you can access that for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or wherever you like to get your podcast. Um, also, as of today, Charlotte's Podcast has released 108 exclusive episodes on our Patreon channel on the craft and business of writing. You can get that at Patreon, P-A-T-R-U-N dot com forward slash Charlotte Readers Podcast. And I think I've done about all the advertising I need to do for the show right now. Um, we got a really great show tonight. This thing we're doing tonight is something uh, we do from time to time. Uh, it's a video presentation we do with authors who've appeared on the podcast in the audio form, but we like to bring them out from behind the shadows and show you their faces. And so that's what we're doing today. We're going to bring them out. We're going to talk. We're going to have a good time. I'm here with three talented authors. Uh, I plan to quiz them on their new books. I plan to uh, talk about them, talk, not talk about them. <laughs> I can't do that. They're here. I can't talk about them. I will talk with them about from inspiration to book promotion. And that thing in between is called the hard work. Uh, quickly, an introduction of our authors, uh, we have Kathy Pickens. Her latest book is uh, Triangle True Crime Stories. Kathy, wave your hands there. Say hello. All right. Hey. Yeah. Uh, we got Frank Morelli. His latest book is On the Way to Birdland. Welcome, Frank. Great to be with you all tonight. Yeah. And uh, also Carrie Knowles. Her latest book is A Musical Affair. Hello, Carrie. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, we're uh, we're missing tonight. Unfortunately, Kathy is. We just learned a few hours ago that she had a personal matter. She had to board a plane to, to deal with hello, that. Carrie. She sends her her regrets. Hello. Hello. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, and we're going to have, uh, have, have, have Kathy turn off that thing in the background. There, so. <laughs> it's on <laughs> Landis. Yeah, we're, we're, Kathy's just testing to make sure we're live. And you just heard. We Meeting my live. phone did not work. <laughs> <laughs> Echo tells us we're live. But uh, about, about Kathy is real quick. Uh, she, she has a new book out. It's called The uh, Last Ordinary Hour. Um, it is, uh, it's a poignant, captivating memoir uh, uh, based on this premise. When you face a moment in life you never see coming, the question is how to live life when nothing is ever going to be the same. Now, Kathy was, uh, she was on Charlotte's podcast in our episode 33, way back in uh, May of 2019. Uh, you can listen to that. She talked about her award-winning book. Uh, it's a memoir called The 100 Story Home. You can listen to that at Charlotte's podcast, wherever you get your podcast. She also wrote a blog post at our community blog titled Finding the Courage to Finish Your Manuscript, which uh, you can find at charlotteroospodcast.com and check that out. That's kind of what we're going to be talking about tonight in some respects, finding the courage to finish your manuscript. So uh, we'll be doing that in a little bit. All right. So sorry, Kathy, uh, Ezra can't be with us today, but so happy to have these uh, three very talented authors, all of whom I've had on the podcast. I've become friends with them. It's a great thing to start a podcast. You meet other authors, you become their friends. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, before we're going to talk about, by the way, guests, you're excited to be here too, right? Yeah. Yes. All right. There we go. All right. Good. Um, before we focus on inspiration, writing, and book promotion, uh, I'm going to introduce our guests in a little more detail and ask them to tell us about their recent book. Now, we're going to start with Kathy Pickens. Kathy, Kathy appeared on the podcast in episode 26. Now, that's a long time ago if we're at uh, 244, <laughs> but that was in March of 2019. And the title of that show was Kathy Pickens Shares Ghost Stories Set in Charleston, South Carolina, and True Crime Stories Set in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, She's also written a blog for our community blog at the podcast website called Crazy Book Guides, in which she explores how to bring books and readers together. Publishers Weekly called uh, Kathy's first mystery, Southern Fried, an assured debut, a cozy with sharp edges. And that book won the St. Martin's Best Traditional Mystery Award in 2003. She's written five books in that series. She's got uh, those, that Charleston mystery book we talked about on the podcast a walking tour of the quirky side of Charleston. She's published a book called Create, Developing Your Creative Processes. And she currently is uh, writing a series on the Carolinas 
historic true crime cases for the history press. I talked to her about the Charlotte crimes because this is Charlotte Rear's podcast, but now she's branched out. She's going to other areas uh, of the state and even to South Carolina next. Uh, Kathy, tell us about the uh, triangle true crime stories. Well, I've, I found for me, um, crime stories may seem a um, unusual way to sort of dig into the history of a place. But I think in a lot of ways, it does define a place. And I've, it's been interesting to move from Charlotte then to Eastern North Carolina and out of the Triangle area because my thesis has been borne out. And um, Raleigh has some crimes in that area that we couldn't have in Charlotte. For instance, the largest prison break in North Carolina. And nobody talks about it anymore. But the Charlotte Observer sent every reporter and photographer that they had up there in the 1950s to cover it. This was supposed to be North Carolina's Alcatraz. It was the prison for the worst of the worst. And um, and my husband and I got to go up there. The place is there. If you want to buy it, I think it's still in the market for $150,000. It has some asbestos and lead problems, but you could own your own prison. So, uh, and no one was hurt in that prison escape, which I think neither guards nor the inmates um, but a substantial number of the prisoners escaped that day. <laughs> and I'm like, we should know that story. Yeah, that's great. And I was looking in the introduction of your book, the first uh, chapter, you say that these cases cover several decades of murder, fraud, family betrayal, uh, a suspected Cold War spy, an unsolved lover's lane murder, uh, discredited investigators, civil rights era clash of Old South and New, the nation's largest prison escape, which you just mentioned, and a couple of North Carolina's poisoners right uh, north carolina has more female serial poisoners than anywhere i've ever found so take that right. for what it's worth so all you all you true crime people this is a it's a it's a fun read triangle true crime stories kathy's also written the one uh, in charlotte which they're actually looking to do something with in some other media have to be shh about that yeah south carolina is uh next i think you're going to go uh, explore crimes there but that's a great great introduction to her book we're going to be talking about uh, inspiration where it comes from both in that book and the books of, uh, of, of Carrie and Frank. But uh, now I'm going to shift to Frank for just a second. Um, th this listeners or viewers, I guess uh, it, we got viewers and listeners here, I guess. So uh, what we're doing here is kind of setting the foundation of the use of legal term. We're talking, we're sort of laying out who the, who the folks are, what they've written, and we're going to come back and layer on that, you know, how they do what they do to give you some suggestions and tips for writing your own work. So now I've got Frank Morelli. Um, Frank appeared on the podcast in episode 59 back in November 2019, an episode uh, that was entitled uh, Frank Morelli's No Sad Songs Forces a Teenager to Come to Terms with the Loss of His Parents and a Grandfather with Dementia. Frank also wrote a blog post for the uh, community blog in our podcast titled Fellow Writers Take Care of Yourselves, uh, which I think is a good tip. He offers some for how writers can unplug. You might offer some of those tips tonight, maybe. <laughs> Frank is the author of the young adult novels On the Way to Birdland and No Sad Songs, which was a 2019 Yalsa Quick Picks for Reluctant Readers nominee and a winner of an American Fiction Award for Best Coming of Age Story. His fiction and essays have appeared in numerous publications, including the Saturday Evening Post, Cobalt Reviewed, Philadelphia Stories, Bug City, if I said that right, and Jersey Devil Press. Uh, his latest book is On the Way to Birdland. It's a great premise. And Frank, I'd love you to tell everyone about it. Landis, thanks a lot for having me on the program again. I really enjoy being on here. It's always, it's always fun to talk about books with you. Um, yeah, my book is uh, On the Way to Birdland. Um, if you're from North Carolina, like many of us on the program are right now, the, the story basically starts in North Carolina, in my hometown of High Point, where I live. It also happens to be the hometown of John Coltrane, where he grew up. Um, and I didn't know that until I moved here in 2005 to become a teacher. Um, and I just was walking around one night, uh, like I, honestly, with my first night here in town. And I came across this statue of Coltrane and I could not believe that I was standing in the town where he grew up. And since then, it was a long time ago, but since then I wanted to use this into, in a backdrop of my story somehow. Um, I write for young adults. Um, I at first was like, wow, this is going to be a really difficult connection to make between jazz and and John Coltrane, who died when he was 42, a long time ago, and young adult literature right now. Um, so it took me a long time to come up with an idea, but I, I created a, a story that's based around this 16-year-old boy named Cordy Wheaton. Um, his family's in, going through some hard times. His brother's struggling with addiction, and is in fact, estranged from the family. And he decides to go out on the road 
about forty dollars in his pocket and nothing else to try to find him. And it basically turns into like a a retelling of the Odyssey up up and down the East Coast. Um, it goes all all over the place in the Southeast, um, from Norfolk, Virginia, into Tennessee. Eventually, he makes his way up to Philadelphia, where he thinks his brother is, and um, and from there, he starts to have these weird visions and and, and strange dreams, and. That's about all I could tell you. If you want to find out how his journey ends and, and yeah. essentially how it begins too, you're going to need to read the book because there are quite a few surprises in it. But it was really fun to do a lot of research about John Coltrane and, and to visit his, his home here. Uh, just last week I was inside. It was absolutely surreal. And to talk to some, some really talented jazz musicians who were able to give me some insights into how I was able to bring him into the story because his brother, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Cordy, my main character, and his brother, being from High Point, kind of idolized this 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 gentleman, and and their life their life actually kind of mirrors that of John Coltrane. So I hope well, you have a chance to pick it up and give it a read. I, I can tell you, uh, viewers, that uh, Frank has a way, uh, being the fact that he's a teacher and spends a lot of time with kids, of of getting into the mind of these uh, middle school, uh, high school kids. I mean, the book starts out second period humanities. We're four days into our personal TED Talks, Mrs. Haynes told us the project would be a creative outlet to express our passions. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so right away you see, you know, the kids here. So, uh, you know, and I read those sad songs, so the same kind of thing, you know, so it's, it's good. You can really, uh, you know, young adult is fun for adults to read too. I found, uh, you know, you can find out a lot. Um, and who better than someone who teaches them to to share that. Thank you, Frank. So, all right, we're going to turn now to uh, Carrie. It's a... really quick, man, it's yeah. an interesting fact. I'm actually sitting in the classroom right now. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> I didn't even get to leave yet. I think they just shelved, they shelved me away at night. Maybe that's why you don't have as good an internet because uh, you're in a school or something, you know. So, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> possibly. All right, we're going to shift now. Uh, I have to keep changing my glasses from short to long here, but uh, <laughs> K K Carrie Knowles, uh, appeared on the podcast. Say, hey, Carrie, wave your hands there. there you <laughs> Carrie appeared on the podcast in episode 74 in January 2020. The title of the show was Carrie Knowles Shares Fiction from Black Tie Optional, The Inevitable Past, and A Garden Wall in Providence, which are three of her books. She wrote a blog post for us on the community blog. It's uh, entitled Get a Grip on Rejection. I like that. Get a Grip on Rejection. Uh, maybe that'll come into play tonight some. Carrie has published five novels, a collection of short stories, and a writing workbook, a self-guided workbook and gentle tour on learning how to write stories from start to finish. She was the North Carolina Piedmont Laureate for Short Fiction in 2014. Her short stories have won numerous awards. She's been a finalist in Glimmer Train com competition six times. Uh, her short story souvenirs won first place in the 2021 Elizabeth Simpson short story contest uh, right here at Charlotte Writers Club. She writes a regular column for Psychology Today, Shifting Forward, A Wanderer's Musings. Carrie, tell us about your latest book, which is A Musical Affair. Well, A Musical Affair. Um, I, the last book I wrote before A Musical Affair, The Inevitable Past, was, um, could be considered by some to be sort of heavy and dark. And so I turned to something lighter for this book. And it's a novel about divorce, deception, love affairs, expensive secrets, long overdue forgiveness, the power of beauty and beauty of music. And just how Celeste, with a little help from her friends, manages to raise over $200,000 to fund a festival. So it's about the backside, the underside <laughs> of what happens in the arts and what makes the arts roll, which yeah. is money. Yeah, you, just, you just didn't cover everything. Though. Right. I mean, so, <laughs> uh, it, it starts out, the last thing Celeste had wanted to do today was to sit through yet another concert pretending she was something she was not. Nothing in her life had turned out the way she had hoped or dreamed it would. I love it. We start with the protagonist and she's down on her luck right away, right? So we're going to have to yes. figure out a way out. To, but she's sitting there uh, getting ready to watch a, a concert. So that's not all bad. Um, that's great. Uh, I like how you shifted. And another thing I like is, and it's part of what we do, viewers on Short Risk Podcast, uh, I guess I just haven't honed in on one particular thing because I like variety. And we, we have a lot of variety here. We have young adult, we have true crime, we have literary fiction. Um, it's all it's all good. It's all different. It's all the same in some respects, but it's all it's it's all a variety is good, right? I mean, I don't know about y'all, but y'all even write variety yourselves. I mean, uh, 
short stories that may be different from what you're writing long in, in the longer pieces. But again, I digress. We're not going there because we got a lot to talk about tonight. And one of the things we're going to talk about is inspiration. So we're going to do kind of a reverse order thing now, uh, starting with Carrie about her book. And I'd first like, Carrie, uh, we're going to talk sort of how the authors were inspired to write these, your latest books. Uh, we'll come back and talk more about tips for inspiration, but let's talk first. Uh, I know a little bit about the backstory because I've read up on it, but I want you to share with our viewers um, what the inspiration was for you to write a musical affair. Um, this is not the usual way that an author writes a book. But, okay, that's uh, great. That's a great start. Great lead. Yeah. <laughs> um, our oldest son is a, a classically trained musician. He lives in Europe. And uh, about 10 years ago, a little bit more than 10 years ago, he called me up one day and he said, Mom, I've got this idea. Um, would you help me run an international music festival in Raleigh? And I said, sure, why not? I'll do that. And like Celeste in the book, I was way over my head in instantly, but thought, I mean, you know, the fact that my son believed that I could do that, I thought, well, if he believes I can do that, sure, I can do that. And um, let me just first say that uh, two things. One is um, it takes a lot longer than you think it does to raise the money. Um, and number two, my publisher, who I'm really like a lot, his partner is a jazz musician. And um, in the midst of bringing this book out, um, the two of them called me and Keith, his partner said, um, I want to run a jazz festi festival in Colorado. Teach me how to do that. And I just thought, I said, read the book, you know? Um, and and I, I want to say something. What, what in, I didn't go into running the festival. I ran the festival with my son for four or five years. I didn't go into it with the idea that I was going to have a book at the end of it. But one day um, while I was drowning, um, someone called me up and a, a big donor called me up and said, so tell me what your levels are. And, and I didn't know what she was talking about. I didn't know what levels were. And I realized very quickly, she was talking about in the back of the program where it says, you know, this person gave $100, this person gave $1,000, this person gave $10,000, whatever. But those were the levels she was talking about. And she said, I, I want to know what the levels are. And so I made them up on the phone. I just kind of <laughs> made them up. And she said, okay, I want to be in the highest level. So you know those levels go from like $100 to $500, $500 to $1,000, whatever. And so there's a, a big range within each of the levels. And she sent me a check for $1 more than the entry level of the highest level mm. so that her name would be in the highest level <laughs> that was a revelation for me yeah, exactly. at that moment i sat down and i thought whoa i was worried about the music i should have been worried about the money but all of a sudden i realized the money meant something else and that there was this intrigue and i asked myself once it, the festival was all over after the five years and many different things happened I said, what if, what if there would have been something that uh, some magical way that I could have gotten that money except for going to every Kiwanis club and every <laughs> Lions club and every council meeting and every Girl Scout club and whatever and eating more sausage biscuits than I should have ever eaten in my entire life and had enough, you know, cold coffee or whatever. Um, I asked the question, what if? And then I created, I had to not really talk about the festival. I had to talk about the other side of the festival. And then I created all these characters mm -hmm. and let them do what they did. So, so just a quick question before I jump to Frank with his inspiration for his book. Um, you said this was not the normal way, Carrie, that you would normally be inspired because you had this real life experience that you went through that kind of gave you this idea. Since you're a fiction writer, uh, what is the normal way for you when you come up with your inspirations? Um, I think that that question, what if, um, I'm always asking myself when I read something in the newspaper or I listen to a conversation or I'm out with friends, I'm always asking that question. Well, I wonder what would happen if, I wonder mm -hmm. what would happen if. And so usually a story, um, I love writing short stories, as you know, 
um, a short story or a, a novel idea comes from that question, what if? And then the creation of, um, of a short story or a novel starts with a character. And um, I would say that I'm a character-driven author, that I create the characters and then turn them loose and truly never know what they're going to do you know, until they've done it. So, that's that's a good way, good way to go. Uh, I had a character uh, burned down a library. I hadn't expected that, you know. Yeah. Happens. <laughs> well, we could talk about uh, how those ideas flit in and out of our heads as authors, but let me, let me jump to Frank just a second. Uh, Frank, uh, you gave us a little bit of the uh, idea about the inspiration, but let's flesh that out a little bit. You're, you know, you're from High Point. You run across something you didn't know existed, which was the fact that Coltrane was from the same town that you were teaching in. It, was that the inspiration for this story? That was definitely the inspiration, but I, I would even go back beyond that in my whole life. I think music overall is just an inspiration. Um, I wrote a book before this called No Sad Songs, which has a lot, has a lot to do with, with punk music and, and grunge music from the 90s and, and poetry. And I, I just love listening to lyrics. And a lot of times that gives me ideas. I also just wish I was a musician and I'm terrible and at, at every <laughs> instrument and I can't sing. So one of the things that I do to try to heal myself from that letdown is that I, I like to try to do research and find out about the actual musicians themselves. So it just was kind of a built-in like coincidence for me to come across John Coltrane in the town where I was getting ready to move to. In fact, it was like almost a deciding factor for me. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a life, lifelong learner. So beyond just like researching musicians, I like to just research locations too and go and explore things. When I first moved down here, um, I, I moved here from, from 96th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue in Manhattan. And then I moved to High Point, which is very different. And oh, first, culture shock, culture shock. Right? Oh, big time. And at first I didn't really know what to think. I didn't know how long I would stay here. Um, but I just started kind of branching out and exploring places and finding out about things. And those always wind up finding their way into my stories, including especially this one, um, because a lot of what happens to Cordy Wheaton, my protagonist, takes place in High Point in locations that I would never have known if I didn't just walk around or drive around and just just explore things. So for me, I've always been kind of an explorer unless we're talking about the forest or the woods at night, then mm -hmm. you're not getting there. But, but get me in a city and I will walk around and explore for hours. And, and always, just like Carrie said, I would, I'm always asking myself, what if? You know, take my own life experience and then ask what if and try to twist that a little bit into what, what makes fiction really, really enjoyable and, uh, and relatable to, to, to young people. I also like to try to just pay attention when I'm in my classroom and do a lot of observing. Um, students, um, Students will say things that adults will not say, and they're oftentimes the most honest things in the world. And, and they really give me insight into just human nature in general. And I think I try to weave that into my characters. And also kindred spirits, Carrie, I am also a character driven author. I create all my characters first and then set them loose in, in the scene that I had. This, this book was slightly different because I knew I had my heart set on creating a story that took place here in, in, in High Point and was built around the legend of, of Coltrane. But but still, I had created Cordy Wheaton long before I started putting together any kind of plot line. And I, I wanted to set him loose in this in this world that I had created and just kind of let him tell me what he was going to do. And it just turned into such an amazing journey. I no, think no, it, no. it makes the writing more interesting. To, it you really know. does. It's almost, like, it's almost like being a reader and a writer simultaneously. Right. You don't really 100% know what's going to happen, but you do. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, Frank, you're in your classroom there. Is that where you teach? Is that right? Uh, it is. It so is. What grade is that? It is an eighth grade classroom and okay. it, right now it kind of smells a little bit like an eighth grade class. Okay. Well, first of all, kudos on your marketing that you've got your books prominently displayed for your students to buy them from you right there in the classroom there. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. You have to do stuff like that. <laughs> I will turn this screen around so you can see what else it looks like. Before, That's right. Exactly. Great, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah we'll get, we'll try do to they think them. it's cool that you write or do they just kind yeah, of hold it, it um, as like they're actually ex extremely supportive. They come out to my oh, events, my book so. launches, and um, they, you know, sometimes will come in and surprise me with a book uh, where they want me to sign it. That's always, oh, that's a, that's always a trip. Um, reading my books sometimes for like independent reading programs. It's pretty fun. And I get, <laughs> a, chance to share, yeah, I get a chance to share some, some stories with them from like book events that, that let them behind the scenes a little bit. Well, when, you're, when your so book cool. is 40 years uh, uh, dated uh, in time. Don't assign it like uh, my my professor did in law school after his book was forty years <laughs> old. I think he assigned us uh, a book that uh, involved uh, 
-hmm. negotiable instruments after they've adopted the uniform commercial code. Nobody really knows what I'm talking about there, except unless you're a lawyer, but <laughs> except Kathy. Yeah. Yeah. They changed the laws, in fact, and he assigned us a book before the law changed. Anyway, I digress there. Uh, we're going to move from the eighth grade classroom where lots of good things happen to crime. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and I guess uh, what I'd say here is uh, Kathy Pickens, other than the fact that, uh, you know, after you'd written Charlotte true crime stories, you got a contract from History Press to write, you know, the Triangle true crime stories. Yeah. What inspired you to write Triangle true crime <laughs> well, stories? I was going to say a contract. <laughs> a um, contract, yeah. yeah, a contract. Yeah. You know, um, I, actually, I'd done Eastern North Carolina, and then um, oh, okay. Triangle. So yeah, I'm traveling the state. Took a little yeah. bit. Contracts are good motivating um, factors, <laughs> but I am. I got so fascinated. I wrote the Charleston book years ago. The Charlotte was very different. I am fascinated to dig into to cases, to stories. To me, they're all stories um, of, of things that I might have heard a little bit about, you know, something that happened, and then dig into it and find out the things I didn't know or that I had forgotten. And even neater is to dig into the stuff and find out things I had no idea about. So for me, like I said, these stories really help paint a picture of an area. And North Carolina is a, a long, skinny state. And the eastern part of the state is so very different from the cities in the center and so very different from the western North Carolina mountains, which I'm more familiar with. It's close to where I grew up. But um, I, in doing this, I came across, the, you mentioned the Cold War spy. He settled in Raleigh. Uh, in Chapel Hill, excuse me, and it, it, that in itself was a fascinating case, but then I said, well, why did he come here, and I saw well, he had family, his wife had family in Saluda, Saluda, North Carolina, is where my father's from, tiny, tiny little town, and um, the the wife's father ran the Esso station, I said, my dad worked at the Esso station when he was a kid, so I called my dad up, I said, do you know so-and-so, well, yeah, um, I worked for him, she was my high school teacher, and I took the daughter to a dance, <laughs> <laughs> so, oh so I'm like, so you know these stories and you haven't been telling me this stuff? <laughs> it's like, you know, so, so it's yeah. like, you know, you find things you didn't expect to find, but the inspiration is because I wrote fiction, I love reading mystery fiction, but the real stories are frankly in a lot of ways weirder and funnier and richer and sadder than anything I can make up. I, yeah. I, you know, and I, I had an editor in New York who who the only thing she ever criticized one time in a book was something she said, well, that just couldn't happen. It was the only thing that was really close to something that really had happened. Yeah. We had uh, Tommy Thomason once at the Charlotte Writers Club. He, everybody from this area knows he's a wonderful writer and yeah. uh, he wrote, uh, he writes nonfiction and he, and he wrote for the observer for years. And I asked him a question that night about uh, why he didn't write fiction. He looked at me kind of puzzled like, and then he said, well, why would I do that? He says, <laughs> you know, the, the true stories are so much more interesting. But having said that, I would say that listening to all three of you uh, and also thinking about some of my own writing, there's a lot of truth in fiction and, and mm -hmm. fiction has to be almost more true <laughs> than, does. than the true stories for people to believe it. And I think, Carrie, you know that because you've written short stories and you talked about right. the, uh, what do you talk about? You talk about the truth. The that's emotional really, truth. The emotional yeah. truth. That's right. Yeah. Speak to that a second. Um, I always say that there's two kinds of truth. There's the um, what actually happened, this happened, and the next thing happened, and the next thing happened. And then there's the emotional truth of what actually happened to the people or to the character. And that's the more interesting is the emotional truth. It's mm -hmm. not the events. Mm -hmm. it's, it's those little stories that came out of those events, um, those moments yeah. of truth. And those are the real truth, I believe. And they're harder to write about. Yeah, it is. And, and it's harder to sustain on a longer piece as well sometimes. All right, well, this is great inspiration for the books you've written. Uh, we're going to talk now about tips related to inspiration because sometimes authors, uh, maybe they're on a deadline, maybe they have a contract, maybe they don't have any of that, but they're just hell bent to get this thing, next thing started. Uh, and they're stuck a little bit, maybe. Maybe they're not stuck. Maybe they got part of an idea. Maybe they got a good idea, but they don't know how to get started on the page. So, but let's talk about inspiration and where it comes from and how you can find it, you know, if you're struggling some. I know, um, Kathy Pickens, you've written a book on Create and, and Carrie, you've written this book on uh, 
you know, the, how to write from start to finish. And Frank, you're teaching eighth graders, you know, how to write. Uh, so this idea of inspiration, you've got to start somewhere. I, I think I'm gonna just go to Frank real quick. You're in the classroom. How do you get eighth graders to start writing? You know, how do you get them to be inspired, Frank? That's a great question. Um, well, it starts, first of all, from being excited about it myself. I think that works a little bit with kids, but, but, but some, some tips that I was gonna actually give to writers out there that I give to my students as well is to start a journal a traditional journal, a dream journal, somewhere where you write any of your thoughts down. That's, that was my starting point when I started writing about, you know, 20, 25 years ago. And I was just writing down tidbits of things. And those, you know, millions of, of, of little journals that I wrote turned into, you know, thousands of short stories and then, you know, hundreds of, of, of essays and then some books at, at the end of it. It just kind of teaches you how to get the juices flowing and, and get the ideas out. And oftentimes you can mine for ideas in those in those journals. So, you know things if if you're stuck and you need a character idea, you may have already created it, and it's in it's in your journal somewhere. So, in, in my classroom, I have my students writing things every day, and sometimes they think they're just random, but they always wind up adding up to something, and then they're amazed, like, "Wow, you planned that!" I'm like, "Yes, that's what teachers do." Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it yeah. is always a magical thing. Well, that's, so we're going to jump around a little bit. I'm going to jump back to Carrie, and then we'll just kind of free flow it here a little bit. Uh, ideas for writers here. Carrie, thoughts on uh, how to find your inspiration? Well, Frank, I, I agree with you. I don't do journals, but I have three by five cards that I keep in my purse or keep in my car, keep on my desk. And I'm forever writing notes on three by five cards, just snatches of phrases, uh, uh, maybe an outline for a character or um, a title for a short story. Sometimes that'll start me up. The other thing is um, when in my writing workbook and also when I do some writing workshops, I always tell people, I cite some research that uh, writing by hand, particularly with a paper and pencil or paper and a pen, but basically they suggest paper and pencil. Um, it, it engages your brain in a very different way than the computer does. And so if you get stuck, I always say, you know, don't turn off your computer, turn away from your computer and start writing by longhand or printing or whatever you, whatever method you have, but do it by hand. Um, and paper and pencil is the best way to sort of get your brain flowing and ideas going. And that may sound like a silly thing, but it really works. Uh, I, think, I, I, think you, I think you and Kat, I'm sorry, Carrie, but you and Kathy must have been talking to each other because y'all are ganging up on me. I can't read my own handwriting. And, and y'all probably saying this for my benefit, I know, because Kathy Pickens has this in her book, Create, and she's, she's all about handwriting. And, and, and three by five cards. And three and, by five and, cards. So keep Kathy, it a creative so, notebook. <laughs> so Kathy Pickens, pick it up from there, and let's let's keep keep the ideas. I, I would say amen, pass the offering plate to what everybody else has said. But I would add, too, pay attention to what attracts you. No matter how weird it is or somebody else would think it was odd, write it on that three by five card or scrap of paper or clip that article out of the newspaper or whatever it is and hold on to it. Cause you don't know why it attracted you, but it did. And you don't have to explain it to anybody, even yourself, but keep it because that's, that's where stories come from. Um, I think we do it with the car. I, I use three by five cards too. I'm big on creative notebooks, um, handwriting, all that. I do think it's an organic art and the most terrifying thing would be for somebody to say, sit down and write. I'm like, oh my God, I, <laughs> without all uh, this sort of warm up that I've done for the last 40 years. So. Yeah, and I, I want to throw something out here and we can all comment on this, but it, it, most of the authors that I interview and now what, 240, that means I've read how many books? Over 240 <laughs> in the last three years. So they all talk about reading. You know, authors mm -hmm. sometimes say, well, I don't have time. Some The authors that aren't really writing a lot say, I don't have time to read. If you don't have time to read, you don't have time to write. But I'm, I'm hearing that reading is so integral to writing. Uh, is it also integral to inspiration? I'm not saying plagiarism. I'm not saying copycat, but just the fact that you're reading other people's work. For me, sometimes it's given me an idea totally unrelated to what they're writing about, but something that I've been thinking about but I see. So let's talk about reading as a way into inspiration. Who's, who's got something on that? I think, can I just jump in for sure. a second? Um, I think it's really, I do a tremendous amount of uh, research. I love research. And I, I think I came out of a, um, a nonfiction background initially. 
And um, I just find when you really dive into research, I'm sure Kathy does, and I know I've heard Frank talk about it, is that all of a sudden a, a different world opens up. You thought you knew something, but all of a sudden something new comes out of this research. And it's like, it, it's like a door has opened up. Um, I always tell people not to, you, know, you always say, write what you know. I always say, don't write what you know, write what you understand. And, you know, do the research so you understand what you're going to be talking about. That's great. Frank, you I jump in really quick. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, we're, we're not an eighth grade class. You can don't have to raise your hand or anything like that. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trained. They train yeah, me. That's right. <laughs> Before I talk about reading, I just had to jump in and, and hold this up because it's a clean sweep. Land. It's all three of us right by hand. I, I, I don't understand anybody can use the computer there's no connection for me and um, so i just wanted to, to expound on that just add, add add that in there as well and, yeah. and for reading um i agree with with carrie but but i also wanted to add that um i like to read outside of my my own genre i mean it's really important to read the books that are in your genre so you know what's out there and, and you kind of know what readers are expecting to see and so you don't re reproduce something that already exists but I like to read things that I would never write, like poetry. I am not, a, I am really not a great poet, but I love to, to read poetry because it changes the way I think about my own work. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say, and, and I would even ex extend that to any art that's outside of what you do. I mean, just going to an art museum and just viewing paintings can really feed you. Um, and and to, to just remark on what you said about the writers who aren't writing, not reading because they don't have time. To me, that sounds like you you know, you, you don't have time to eat because I, a <laughs> professor once told me that if you're going to be a writer, reading is eating, it feeds you. And if you don't feed yourself, you can't produce anything. So once you stop, once you stop that cycle, you're probably going to cut off your inspiration. I 100% agree that we should get out of our comfort zones. I actually signed up for and participated at Charlotte Lit locally in Charlotte here in a class that was slam poetry. And everybody oh, who knows yeah. me knows that Landis Wade is not a slam poet, but I made it through the class and actually wrote a slam poem. Well, maybe you are now. So, well, so yeah. Okay. Now, now we, I, I'm going to go back to Carrie for a second because I must be because Carrie, let's tell them what's in the beginning of your book and what people have to do when they sign up for one of your classes. They have to say, I am what? I am a writer. I am it's a writer. sort of like AA, you know, the yeah, AA yeah. for writers. Everybody <laughs> has to go around and they have to say, my name is Carrie and I am a writer. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, they also have to find a friend to say that to, but not a family member because you don't want anybody to laugh at you. Okay. <laughs> well, we got, and, uh, we got three things we're going to cover tonight. I'm inspired by the inspiration conversation, but uh, we're, we're take, we got three topics uh, leading the third being book promotion, but we got that kind of muddy middle. Okay. We've come up with this inspiration. We've got the idea. We're psyched. We sit down, we start writing. Um, but this is not a short story. It's a commitment. <laughs> we are going to talk writing process and how to stick with a project. Now, I will say this to viewers, you know, no two writers do things the same way. All three on here and me, we all may do it a different way. So what you're hearing is, you know, their processes, how they do it, what works for them, you know, take what works, throw out what doesn't. You know, I think that's probably the what most writers who give advice would tell you, you know, uh, if it doesn't work for you, do something else. But I'm intrigued. And I want to find out about the writing processes uh, from our uh, guest today, because, you know, it gets hard in the book. You know, you, you've been working on it for a long time. You're, you're in the middle of it. You, know, you get stuck sometimes. You, uh, you, you know, we're in that muddy middle. We're trying to make it interesting and ramp it up. We're into our 20th revision. We're sick of the book we're, <laughs> we're writing. We want to go write something else. We're tired of this damn book. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody please publish this before I kill mm -hmm. myself. <laughs> we're, we're, in, we're in this thing. We got to persevere, persevere, persevere. So let's talk writing process. Uh, I'm going to start this time with Frank. Uh, Frank, tell us a little bit about your writing process. Um, and I'm curious about how y'all get all these handwritten a piece of paper into the computer because they got to get in there sometime. So Frank, talk your writing process uh, and how you persevere through it with what you do. Well, my writing process definitely changed a lot from the time I first started trying to write long form like novels. And, uh, you know, I, I wasn't much of a planner before and I used to kind of get a rough outline going and then try to just plow my way through a book and I would find myself basically stalling out maybe about halfway, three quarters, a lot of the time. I have a bunch of unwritten books laying around that will probably I've lost the feeling for at this point, but I decided that I was going to sit down and actually 
put together a story, a real story plan. And the first one that I ever wrote was for No Sad Songs. And, um, and it made a huge difference because uh, I started out with creating characters. Like I said before, I put them into a, into a, uh, into a setting that I created and, and, and did an entire study on. I had like pages and pages of documentation on, on, on every single setting that I created in the book um, and the characters. And then I basically create this massive outline that I literally is on paper and folds out like an accordion. And, and I have a bunch of these around my house. They start to get worn and faded. I show them to my students. They can't believe that I do this. Um, from there, I start to break that gigantic outline. I, I can't believe that you do this, but I could go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> a lot of work. That's a lot of work. Frank. It is. It's tons of work. It's most, yeah. of, most of the work is on the front end for me. And then uh, once I start to break it down into, into what I would look at as, as basically being chapters of the book, then I have small chunks that I can bite off as I go and where, where I could find time to actually sit down and do it. And I'm really good when I can put together a block of time where I can, can sit down and actually write a full chapter. Um, and then I just start, it, it just starts happening. I start plowing through because I only know that I have to get from the beginning to the end of one chapter. It's more like writing a bunch of short stories than it is being totally overwhelmed by the, the size of, a, of an entire novel. Um, and then, I, you know, once it's written, I get it done. Um, it's time to start typing. And that <laughs> is not fun. I got to tell you, that is not fun, but it also creates a situation where I've done a, a, a step of, of editing and revising while I'm typing things in. So I get to know my story better. I do some rewriting. And by the time I put, th put forth that effort of the typing in, I, I have a really good draft that's ready to go. And then at the end, and this is, I think, the most important part, every single time you finish a piece of writing, whether it's one chapter, even a day of writing, give yourself some kind of gift, whether that's time off, an adult beverage, whatever you need, <laughs> you need a gift. You've done something amazing. It will keep you going. Yeah, that, that's great. You know, Frank, they probably have programs out there that will, you know, help you with that long thing that you're unscrolling, but uh, you, you've got a, a catch. <laughs> head. She's telling me, don't send people there. You know, have them handwrite it and create these long scrolls and stuff. Yeah, long know. scrolls. Yeah. Tacked yeah. all over the place. Yeah. Well, I wish uh, I had one with me. You, will, you all would laugh at it. We should, we no, because I'll, it will look very familiar to me. <laughs> we should have called this writing in hand with Frank, <laughs> Kathy, and Carrie, you know. Uh, all right, well, Carrie, while Carrie's coming back to us, I'm going to jump to Kathy. Yeah, uh, sorry, it's kind of a household emergency. I had to quick, quick, quick take care of it. That's all right. We're, we're, Frank's just giving us some great uh, uh, tips here on his writing process. We're jumping to Kathy. Uh, so, uh, Kathy, you, you probably, like Frank, have, have evolved, too, with how you do your writing process. Yeah. Talk about your process and how I, you stick with it. I, I believe in the big method, B-I-C, but okay. in chair, okay. big in hand, or laptop. <laughs> I, I do type at times but oh uh, and i used to make my living typing i worked my way through law school typing and playing the church organ so you know it's it to me it is an organic process as carrie said but i also want to say um, i'm a very persistent person i think persistence beats talent every time and i've I set aside time to work i know how much i can get done in a day i set that word goal if i don't make it that day because of some disaster then i go back and pick it up later but I have a plan, and, and like Frank says, I plan ahead of time. That really does help. A bit anal retentive there, I have to admit. But I also want to say this. Sometimes projects don't work. Um, I have books that I've walked away from, one in particular that I really want to get back to, but it sort of spawned these um, crime histories that I'm doing, so I don't regret that. I have two novels that I've finished since 2015 that are sitting there, and I'm not quite happy with them. So mm -hmm. they're going to sit there for a little longer until mm -hmm. I am. I, but, mm -hmm. you know, if this were my first book, I wouldn't feel that way. Um, I would have taken the advice somebody gave me and wrote it the way they wanted it. But it's not the way I want it. And um, so you do change over time okay, <laughs> and mm -hmm. become more confident about what you're doing. But you really do have to recognize this is hard work. And just sit down and do it. And like you say, recognize that it's hard work and give yourself that pat on the back and come back tomorrow. Yeah. And just to follow up, Kathy, uh, you know, Frank was talking about how earlier he maybe did more of a pantser approach, but then he mm -hmm. planned more with his first No Sad Songs novel that was real successful uh, and it worked for him. Um, you know, there are very successful pantsers out there. And mm -hmm. for those who are viewing it, you know, that's writing by the seat of your pants, you know, letting the inspiration flow over you, perhaps, whatever, you know, just write, write, write. But if you're writing what you wrote, Kathy, and were successful with mysteries, sometimes 
you'll get down a rabbit hole and you'll think, wait a minute, where did I just go? And how am I, how does this tie into the mystery? I'm right. You got to have a little, maybe there's a combination of pants and planning. There's yeah. some, you know, I, I, I don't do Roman numeral one period, skip two right. spaces. Um, you know, I, so it, it's more like what Frank's described with this map sort of right. thing that goes together. But I know some very successful pantsers who are mystery writers with very complicated plots. So mm. I think people need to feel comfortable playing with what works for them. But understand if you're if you're flying by the seat of your pants riding by the seat of your pants, you got more work to do in the rewrite phase. That's true. It all yeah. the work's got to get done somewhere. Yeah. And so however it works for you, great. But I know people, oh I finished my book. I which what they mean is they finished their first draft. <laughs> and those of us who've done this before know, oh well you're <laughs> just started kathy, see me you know, back you, on, on t number 23 <laughs> kathy knows that very well because she was kind enough to give me feedback on my novel that's coming out next year and uh you know where, while you're while you're reading landis's yeah, book he's yeah. rewriting it from it, the it, other it, end exactly exactly yeah it, exactly. And it's like it's like one of these things you know well, she has some good advice i think it was uh there was one scene in the book where i killed off everybody in the, yeah. in the book club and she said you know landis everybody can't die in this yeah. book you know, you gotta be somebody who's gonna survive in this book you know so, so you know it went from like one hundred twenty thousand words down to about eighty five thousand and then kind of eighty five thousand darn good words yeah well thank you for that i appreciate mm -hmm. it so it is it is a process because uh and i thought i had a little bit of an outline going because i used scrivener and i would use these chapter headings as kind of my that's how I did an outline because you can actually put chapter headings, you can move them around, all this kind of stuff. Even if you've never written anything in the chapter, you just kind of use it as a way to think ahead. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself because I want to let Carrie talk about her method. Uh, Carrie, are you pantser? Are you planner? Are you a little bit of both? I'm a pantser. You okay. know, all right, good. I, was I, the, I, I need to kind of back up. Um, yep. And, uh, you know, I know some people say, well, how do you finish something or whatever? Um, the miracle of the computer is that you can have more than one project going at a time and mm -hmm. it's not a mess on your desk. And so um, uh, because of circumstances with my family and whatever, I had to pay for college on my own and I wound up, and you know this story, Landis, um, I paid for my last two years of college by writing for a, a Michigan sports magazine called Competitive Breed. And I covered a drag boat, speed, speed boat, motorcycle, <laughs> drag car races on the weekends and wrote about it, turned in my copy on Monday morning. And that's how I paid for school. And um, I, you know, I've always made my living being a writer and lecturing about writing. And so I didn't have the luxury of, you know, saying, oh my, what am I going to do today? Because you know, <laughs> I always had a deadline. And so I'm a pantser who's had constant deadlines all her life. So um, if I get into a, a, a rut with a story or whatever, I just switch to the next thing I'm doing. I just, you know, save that file and move to the next thing that has a deadline. And I just keep on doing like that. And now I'm gonna say the most unpopular thing I'll say tonight, which is um, I never really know what the story is completely about until I get to the end of a novel, till I write the last page. And when I write the last page, I set it down, I spend a week, I think about what the last page was, and then I go back to the beginning of the book and I figure out what's missing and what shouldn't be there to drive the story to that last page. Mm. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's a great point here. You, you just brought up an, a, a point and it's been hinted to uh, by Frank and Kathy, and that is that when you get into whatever process you follow, when you get to that point where you're in the revision phase, that's where the real work begins. And that's where the story actually mm -hmm. comes together, right? I see a lot of heads nodding there. Y'all have been through this, you know, you know, the, so, some people might think of it as drudgery after the 18th or 19th or 20th, but if you can step back, what I was doing recently was taking a week or two off between hard edits, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, when you came back to it, it was amazing to me. And I'm sure y'all have experienced this something you would see or something you would think about, which you wouldn't have thought about if you'd have read it again quickly, 
after the last time you read it. I always say you got to let it cook. You know, you got to like okay. set it aside and let it marinate for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Use the same exact term. Absolutely. Yeah. Just don't let it burn, right? Yeah. Just <laughs> don't let it burn, right? But let it marinate and and uh, mm -hmm. you know give you a chance to take a breath away from it. Yeah. 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 So, um, and Frank, you wrote the blog post for us about, you know, writers looking after themselves is part of that idea for that blog post. The fact that writing is hard and sometimes you've got to do some things just to step away. You mentioned giving yourself a gift when you finish, but what about in the mean, in the in-betweens when it's going hard? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. I mean, I, I think at all times you got to, you got to, you need to be, it's a, it's a hard you know, venture being a writer and you, there's so many ups and downs to it. And there's a lot more downs sometimes than ups, <laughs> I think, um, because you can be hard on yourself and you can write something that you're just not happy with. You can work really hard. And then at the end, the product isn't what you wanted and you have to go back. Um, so it's important to, to throughout the whole time you're writing to, to make sure that you a realize that you, you, you're not chiseling anything into stone and that you can mm -hmm. always find people that can, you know, shed some light on what you're not, what you're missing in the story if you're not happy with it. Um, you could also be trying to send copies out to, to agents and, and, um, and publishers, and you could be getting, you know, rejections back um, all throughout that time. You need to just make sure that you maintain a level head, keep yourself moving forward. Somebody's going to see your story and like it, keep that confidence going and yeah, treat yourself. <laughs> you have to treat yourself to, to things, take a night off, take a week off. I, I really like your idea, Landis, about um, taking a week away from each draft. Sometimes I even spend more time than that just to let it get out of my head because you will come back and read it like a stranger after that. Yeah. Somebody yeah. else's words. Yeah. Right. What's comforting to me is having interviewed all these authors on the podcast is, and some, you know, like yourselves, very, very talented. Y'all have got a lot of books. Uh, and then some that are on the New York Times bestseller list who've had 19 bestsellers. Had John Hart on. He's won this uh, award seven years in a row. Uh, and he says it's hard work. And he says, you know, he got rejected. And when you hear those stories that everybody's getting rejected, then it's not just you, right? It, I mean, this is just a, a competitive yeah. environment. And which kind of gets to um, this idea, I think, of uh, writing because you enjoy writing. And I, I think all of you we all talked about how hard, hard it is. But every one of you, raise your hand, we all like to write, right? I mean, that's what we enjoy doing. Um, nobody twisted my arm and made right, me do it right, right. <laughs> yeah and we didn't twist your arm to come on this thing and talk about it either you know we, oh, yeah. huh. and, and so uh, which i got a segue because we got you know 10 15 minutes left we're going to talk about uh, something that uh, many authors would rather not talk about it's called book promotion i mean i had this thing i did in the early stages of the podcast where i would ask 10 questions about writing process do you write in the morning the evening do you like music on do you use a dictionary or spell check and i'd get to the last one and the alternative was book marketing or manual labor and i've got so many authors that are willing to do manual labor around my house now who don't want to do book marketing and it's just sort of this uh pavlovian response you know no no i don't want to do book marketing please don't make me do book marketing. Mm. But I'd like to ask a question because, um, you know, why, first of all, why does it matter? I mean, why should authors care about book promotion? I know we kind of joke about it. Yeah, that's not what I do. I'm not into the, I'm more of an artist. I don't like to write. I don't really like, to, but, you know, if you've got something you're proud of, I mean, why shouldn't you want to be learning about book marketing? What are y'all's thoughts on this? Why should authors want to get better just as good at book marketing as they are at getting to be better writers. Let's just round robin it here. I think one of the reasons, Land, is is because when you when you first start getting you know books completed, you really want to commute. You want your you want to be able to communicate with readers. You want it to reach the hands of people who are going to read it and give you feedback. And it's not really about like you know I want you to pay me your money so that you can take my book, or I want to hear oh you're such you're the greatest person in the world. I legitimately like I enjoy talking to readers. Sometimes have the best conversations with readers who have read my book and didn't like it and give me mm -hmm. give me critical feedback and it helps me to grow as a writer. So, so part of getting books into people's hands, there are so many books out there now. There, it's, there are more books on the planet that are new now. I, I can't even imagine how many came out just today alone. It was a massive release day. Um, and it's really hard to get your book in front of readers. So 
Um, and there's, they have a lot to choose from. So it's really important that you let them know who you are. Um, readers like to know the person who's writing it now. Um, I'm not a huge fan of that. I will, I will say that. I, I love to be a private person. I would love to be able to hide behind my, the covers of my books. But at the same time, being able to see your book in people's hands and having, having a chance of, to hear them reach out to you and talk to you about your own work, it's, it's awesome. So part of the, the, the struggle of going out there and having to promote yourself, it's, it's kind of worth it when you see those results. Well, Carrie, uh, you you have people writers, you know, do the AA thing. I am a writer. Um, my name is. What what should they be saying when it comes to marketing? Well, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the last two years of all of our lives, mm -hmm. and how COVID really, in many ways, turned the book promotional world upside down. Mm -hmm. You know, I think previous to this time, you know, everybody saw the way to market a book is bookstores, 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 and more bookstores. And that's just, that didn't work the last two years. Um, and I, I don't think it's a workable thing now, especially most bookstores are uh, very hesitant at this point to have a lot of authors come into their store. And if you're not a uh, number one top seller, um, often you're not invited. So, you know, it's like we have to, I was faced with the fact even before that, that it's important to get out of the bookstore box. You know, wh where, where are other ways to connect? And thank you, Landis, for being here because you have created a way for authors to connect with readers, which is wonderful. And actually from working with you, I've gone out and kind of tried to tap onto other podcasters mm -hmm. and say, mm -hmm. let me be on your show. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is um, stepping back from your book once your book is completely done and taking an honest view of your book and say, where are the niche audiences here? And Frank, you know, has a situation. Um, he could go with his YA book to a jazz podcast mm -hmm. and talk about Coltrane and um, the inevitable past. I was just on um, the Mystic Stars podcast, which uh, because <laughs> there good. is a ghost in that. <laughs> yeah, there's a ghost in that book. There is a supernatural thing that happens right. in that book. It's a good book. I read it. Yeah. Quite yeah. Now. Right. Um, and so I thought, I I've never thought of that group as being part of my audience. But for that book, they were part of my audience. Um, when I did the little French book, you know, Garden Wall in Provence, um, I went to a French wine and bookstore and did a talk there. Um, that, and so it's, it's like, you know, I think all of us, particularly people who are not, you know, on the New York Times bestsellers list, I think we have to become very, very creative and uh, we have to find our audience in a different way. And, um, uh, you know, the book clubs that I've done that all of us have done, I'm sure in these last two years have been Zoom book clubs, which I love and I would do them for anyone, but they're hard work. I mean, that is really, really hard work. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to keep all those little pictures in line and who's <laughs> moving forward to ask a question and what's going on. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, usually I'm, I'm face down on my food by the time one of those is over, but I will do a hundred of them. If a hundred book clubs said, yeah. we'd like you to come, I would be there, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, I'd like to hear what other people have thought of. Can I just take one more minute? Sure. And then, sure. then I'll, I'll shut up for the whole time you don't have to shut so, up the whole time but just tell us what you got yeah. in your mind so um with uh the the last book a musical affair um i had i decided i wasn't going to ask other authors to write the blurbs so i went to arts people and one of the arts people i went to is um eric uh woodall who is the artistic director of the north carolina theater and he read my book and he called me up and he said this is a movie. I said, yeah, I know that. And he said, no, it really is a movie. So if you go to my website, you'll see that I have a, um, I'm doing a fantasy casting <laughs> of the main characters of the book and people who've read the book can, you know, we've picked with, Eric is also <laughs> a casting director in New York and he helped me learn what a casting director does. And the two of us have worked together and in a month's time, we are going to select the winners of the casting 
and my publisher is going to send each of the actors a <laughs> copy of the book and say, you know, yeah. field of, right. That's a, that, that's, a, that's, that's a great <laughs> idea. That's a great idea and very creative way to engage, you know, readers too. And you said a lot in there that, uh, you, you know, we could unpack, you know, what's happened last year versus now. I do think it's just caused a lot of authors uh, in a good way, uh, myself included, to start thinking um, beyond traditional ways of marketing, uh, you know, try, trying out the Zooms to Facebook Lives, trying out Instagram Lives, trying book clubs virtually, try, you know, connecting and doing what Carrie just talked about, maybe author conversation, just doing different things. Uh, I like the, the idea of a theme connecting, you know, the, the underlying themes of your book to something else. Like, uh, you know, Frank, you're, she mentioned your underlying theme, you have a lot of music in there. Well, Kathy, your true crime, you know, you can be on a lot of other true crime podcasts mm -hmm. talking about true crime in these areas. And Kathy, I would say, you know, we being pushed into our uncomfortable zones, you're, you're trying some things now. We, we got a publicist together who <laughs> pushes us pretty hard. Shout out to Hannah Rue. Uh, but, uh, you know, talk about that, Kathy, the, 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 to, you know, authors feel uncomfortable at times sometimes with their writing. When we feel uncomfortable with our marketing, is that a good thing? And talk about it from you personally. You know, Hannah, you know, Hannah LaRue is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I'm terrible at social media. Invite me to speak. I'm there. I'll do it on Zoom. I'll stand on my head, whatever. Um, <laughs> when my mysteries came out, they were the Southern Fried Mysteries from St. Martin's in New York. I mailed boxes of moon pies to every mystery <laughs> bookstore in the country. Guess what? There were mystery bookstores in the country 20 years ago. Yeah. There's not very many now. So it's not just COVID that's changed. There's been a lot that's changed. And social media is a big part of that. But Hannah said, now you want a business page, not your personal page, because in case you want to post your Thanksgiving pictures, I said, it's not going to happen. Mm. Well, you might want to post. No, it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's, just never, it's never going to happen. I have no relationship with uh, with Facebook. They would involve me posting my family pictures. Right. Um, so it's for some of us, it's relearning um, how to build relationships, because it's one thing to build relationships like you know, you're sitting down talking to people at a book club or in a bookstore or, you know, on Zoom even. Um, but I think that, again, it calls on our creativity to, mm -hmm. to find those new ways. But, but the whole thing is about relationships. It's like, it's like, Frank, it's like you said, people want to get to know you and, and feel like they kind of, like you said, get behind the book cover and, and see who you are. And I, God, I just think how cool it would have been when I was coming along and didn't have the nerve to tell somebody I wanted to be a writer to meet somebody who was a teacher of people my age who was a writer. Mm. It's just, we find those ways. I'm working with women in recovery now. They're not going to go buy my books, but I'm watching people find their own stories, which, you know, that's, that's a neat relationship for me. Yeah, and I'd like to say there's a long game and a short game when it comes to book promotion. You know, yeah. a lot of times authors think myopically about, how to sell this particular book, yeah. what I'm going to do, what, how I'm going to promote this. But if they step back from that, just like if you step back from your writing a little bit and look at the bigger picture, um, for the same reason Kathy mentioned that our, our publicist says people want to see some of your personal pictures, they want to know more about the writer. They want to know more about why the writer's writing what the writer's writing. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to be able to connect. Just, I mean, it's almost like why do people read books to connect with the characters, right? Well, so in marketing, they're trying to connect a little bit with the uh, author. So think about that. If you're a character-driven author, maybe you can be a character-driven marketer. <laughs> hey, I just came up with something. You Let's just came that. up with something. <laughs> Great idea. Character-driven marketing. All right, okay. Can somebody write that down on one of your in handwritten <laughs> journals there so we can remember that. Uh, Frank, I'm going back to you for some ideas uh, here because uh, um, I know that you've done the YA books uh things that you've done that you've enjoyed uh, in the marketing world. And then we'll just kind of go around maybe some favorite things that we've done that other people might get ideas from. Well, I love what, what you all were saying about social media and being able to get on there. I, I recently tried to create a YouTube channel. It's been hard to do that. I, I have uh, my, I'm tipping my cap to, to what you do all the time, Landis, and how, <laughs> how, how professional everything was. I'm looking. It is difficult. Um, but one thing that I did do that was kind of neat on there uh, was just being an observant person, all right, as usual. And I found a person literally named Frank Morelli, 
who is <laughs> a world-class bassoonist. And uh, I've known him for a long time. So we decided to put together a discussion about jazz music. He invited one of his saxophone uh, playing buddies, uh, Keith Oxman, to, to have this conversation. And we just literally talked about music. And we weren't really, just like you were saying, to take a step back from your work. We didn't really spend a lot of time trying to promote ourselves. It was more of just a conversation about us as in, in, and what we take out of music mm -hmm. and teaching because we're all, all three of us were teachers and how we like to communicate with each other. And I feel like that conversation was really successful because I think people saw us as people instead mm -hmm. of as these, you know, these names on the covers of books or on the covers right. of the albums. Right. Um, another thing that I really enjoy, and this is getting away from social media and, and you know, getting more in person, um, don't forget about the library systems that are out there. There are so many libraries Absolutely. and they put on a lot. They're always looking for programs to put on. Um, don't be afraid to reach out to libraries that are in your area. I, I enjoy going in um, as, as a person who writes for young people. Um, I oftentimes get asked to do workshops and, and you know, talk about writing to, to, to children. Um, and in, in, the, in the course of that, I have a chance to wind up talking about my books, which wind up getting into their hands somehow. But the out actual outcome of it wasn't really to try to do that. It was really no. to just go in there and talk about writing. So I, I really like that advice, uh, Landis, that you, that you said, stepping back away from your work and thinking about it more holistically. Yeah, and, and I'll get I'll go around here and other favorite things that y'all have done, but I want to mention this in the context of podcast and YouTube because while my podcast, Charlotte's podcast, you know, we do take a book uh, like these three books and we focus on the book, we focus on the writing. Uh, there are a lot of podcasts out there that are, uh, nonfiction related. They've got a theme, you know, it could be sci-fi. It could be something. I mean, I was on one podcast called mm -hmm. dudes in hyperspace, you know, I mean, it, it, you find something that's interesting um, to talk about uh, related to your book. And at the end of the day, it's, Oh, and by the way, they have this book. And if they like you and they like the story you're telling, they might go pick up your book. And it's not all about uh, please read page one through 10, please, please, you know, whatever. It's more about the story underneath the book. And I know, uh, you've got the, you know, Coltrane, you know, Carrie, you've got the music in this book. You had the ghost in the previous book. Um, Kathy, you've got the true crime, but you've got the mysteries too. Uh, I did for my first three books, which were Christmas books. I went to a festival every year around Christmas. I sold more books at the Christmas festival mm -hmm. than I sold anywhere else because, hey, people were excited about, you know, Christmas. Uh, you can go to these festivals, um, find your niche. You can go on podcast, you know, find your niche and don't look for the plot part of the story. Look for the underlying theme part of the story. Right. I mean, Kathy, you could go on and talk about Razor Girl. You know, plenty of people want to hear about her from your Charlotte. Plenty of people. Plenty of people already have. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, talk, talk. <laughs> Carrie, what's one of your favorite uh, sort of events you've done in the book marketing world? Oh, in the book marketing, I, I think just, um, Lately, I've, I've concentrated on podcasts, but um, I agree with you 100% to, mm -hmm. you know, to just find, and you'll be surprised, especially, I mean, you must have, each novel must have a half a dozen niches in it. Right. Um, and you just have to step back and see those and mm -hmm. be able to talk about them. Um, sometimes they're food related. Sometimes they're location related. Sometimes they're historically related. Um, and then just kind of be aware of, you know, what's going on. Is there a conference? Is there a this? Is there a that? Um, and uh, I think because I write both fiction and nonfiction, um, I, I get invited to do some interesting things. Um, I, I'm doing a journaling class for uh, a, a special autoimmune disease over the weekend. Um, and, you know, that's something that I never would have thought to go to them. They came to me because of another reason. Um, and, you know, it's like, don't turn down in the invitation that you get, um, whatever it is. Don't say no, right? Don't, don't say, no. say no. No, you don't say no. You say, yes, yes, I can do that. Yeah, I'd love to do that. That sounds yeah. like a lot of fun, you know. And, and I would add to that, you know, writers are, uh, by nature, at least the ones I've met in North Carolina, are very collegial, they're very supportive. Yeah. You know, when you get a chance, and unless you're just totally overwhelmed, if somebody invites you to, you know, blurb their book, uh, g give it a, give it a shot. I mean, assuming they have taken it seriously and had an editor or whatever, you know, but I mean, that's another way to help support another writer and also do something good. And then people will see your name and that kind of thing. So 
that those are things that you can do as well to support uh, not just the community, uh, but you're, most of the time when you're supporting other people, it's going to come back and support you, right? Right. Um, so and you just be aware of building bridges. Right. Um, right. You know, I met somebody the other day who, uh, you know, uh, who lives down the street in my Ohio home, and she writes supernatural, uh, paranormal pieces, which is a genre that I have never, ever, ever considered or mm -hmm. knew nothing about. And I said, you know, we, we switched books. I said, you read my book, I'll read one of your books, and let's have tea. Yeah. And so I've made a connection with this whole That's paranormal cool. <laughs> world of writing. And it's like, why not? I mean, you yeah. know, something will come from that. And she, something will come from her making a literary connection. And uh, you just make the connections wherever they come up. And you say, yes, let's do that. That's, that's great. Kathy Pickens, do you have a favorite uh, thing you've done in the book uh, world, um, marketing? You know, I, I, I think that I would, I agree with what everybody said. It's, you make those relationships, you make those connections. I also encourage people to not think you have to do everything. Mm -hmm. It can be very overwhelming. And so for some people, it's just terrifying to think about going to teach a class or lead a workshop. That's not their sweet spot, but they may be brilliant on Facebook and know how to get into the discussion groups and know how to navigate, navigate that in a way that I couldn't imagine. So writers always throw out all these things and have these great ideas because they are creative people, but you take a step back if, if, and do what feels comfortable to you. Yeah, that's, and that's, listen, there's nobody, I, the, the New York Times bestseller people, the, the top 10 may not be having to do any of this. Mm -hmm. Everybody else has to. Yeah, exactly. I, I meet people that think there's something else, you know, there's some secret and somebody's going to do it for them. No, it's, it's yours. No, you, you, got, you. you got to pick your battles, what you're comfortable with, what you want to do. And then, there's always this thing called, you know, hiring other people to help you, you know, th <laughs> things that are outside your comfort zone. And, and by that process, you get educated on some yeah. really good ideas that maybe you wouldn't have had otherwise. So it's, uh, it's just part of the process. If you're going to be right, you might just spend a little money every now and then. Much better. All right, we're going to run out of time here. we got a couple minutes. I want to ask this one question. I do it every time on the podcast. I'm going to run around the table here and, and do it. Uh, it's this question uh, about, uh, you know, what you've learned uh, since you started with this thing called writing. Uh, uh, so we'll start, let me see, we started with, uh, we'll go back to Frank again. Uh, Frank, uh, you know, tell us one thing you've learned that you wish you knew when you started writing books. Uh, uh, one thing I learned that I wish I knew when I started writing books is that this is, this is a much more time consuming <laughs> process than I ever thought. Um, it's also a very difficult process and there's more rejection than, than, than not. And, um, the, I think the money thing, uh, I didn't never, I never really got into writing for the money, but I thought that there would definitely, it would be easier to make money as a writer. And, uh, it is definitely not. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, I, I think that I wish I would have known that earlier because it certainly, at a certain point I came to terms with that and realized that the writing was the important part. And that I could not ever do without it. So I wish I just knew that when I was 20. That's a great, great answer. Carrie. Now I'm uh, 25. So yeah, you're very old, Frank. You're mm -hmm. very old. Carrie, <laughs> Carrie, what is one thing uh, you've learned that you wish you knew when you started writing books? Um, when I started writing books, I think that it would have been helpful. One of the things I've learned is that you can write a great story, you can write a great book, and it might be rejected. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. And you just have to find the, the next place. That's I had a short story um, that I, when I finished it, and I spent a lot of time on it. When I finished, it, I knew it was a really terrific short story. And I didn't have the confidence in myself at that point. And I sent it to a, a good, but not a great journal. And they rejected it and actually said something snide about it. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it and I thought, no, they're wrong. They're wrong. And I sent it, fortunately, I sent it to a lesser journal. And this went on and on. till I went to some tiddlywinks journal where, you know, th <laughs> that was run off of a Xerox machine or something. <laughs> and they rejected it. And I got so mad one day, I said, that's it, who's the best? Yeah. And I sent it to Hammer Train and it won first place. And I got it. <laughs> that's a great right. story, I love that story. And it had too. been rejected yeah. by everybody. And I mm -hmm. think that 
if I would have known how often you get rejected and that what it means mm -hmm. is um, that that person just didn't, you, you weren't his cup of tea or you weren't her cup of tea. And um, you just find somebody who connects with you mm -hmm. and you will find somebody who connects with you. That's great. we got a couple minutes left. Kathy, uh, what is one thing you've learned you wish you would know when you started writing books? Enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Frank, you make me laugh. It's like I've made, I, there's so many more ways to make money. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This, this oh, is yeah. not it. <laughs> yeah. But enjoy it. This is the best job there is. You know, yeah. I, I quit all the others to do this one. It's, uh, yeah. It is. Enjoy well, uh, it. Enjoy this it. Is, this has been a joy tonight. I learned so much. This is my, you know, I, 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 did, I decided, okay, am I going to start a podcast and talk to authors? Or am I going to go back to school? And I said, I don't want to go back to school. I'm going to go just learn from authors. And this this is part of my learning process. I really appreciate y'all sharing, you know, your experiences and what you've learned because it helps other authors as well. Um, thanks for being a part of the Charlotte Rears podcast video segment, uh, you know, that we have here. And for viewers out there, you know, check us out at charlottespodcast.com uh, or wherever you'd like to listen to your podcast. And we've got a YouTube page and a couple other things. And uh, yeah, so Carrie, Kathy, Frank, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank, Thank you, Landis. Thanks. Great fun. See you, listeners. Please check please us out at charlottespodcast.com. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. See y'all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>